wiped out. I could trip a referee. Tell by my attitude that I most definitely from. We are here at another This Week in Stardust. We're live from South by Southwest. Let's see the audience cam. Let's see the audience cam. Whoa. We've got a packed house here. I just saw Tony Shea's bus pull up, but I, could, I had to uh, take advantage of the fact that we have three previous guests here. Uh, and wow, packed room. This wasn't going to even happen, but I got an email from the Sonos folks like two or three weeks ago and the Bing folks saying, are you doing this week in startups at South by Southwest? And of course I said, um, are you paying for it? And they said, yes. And I said, great, we're doing it. So thank you to uh, Bing and Sonos for making this possible. Big round of applause. Thank you, guys. It's seriously, seriously expensive to do something like this. As you can imagine, we had to fly a bunch of people here. Uh, a lot of jet fuel on the Mahalo plane had to be burned to get Al here. Al Gore's not happy about this no, at Al Gore's not happy about it. Tyler, you're here. Uh, we got here last night. We were on Tony Shea's bus, which is madness. Um, but before Tony gets in here, I uh, wanted to uh, say hello to Brian Alvey, who was the first guest on This Week in Startups uh, and who was my partner at Weblogs, Inc. and is now uh, running and is the CEO of CrowdFusion. Welcome to the program, Brian Alvey. Oh, your mic's on. Is it on? Check, check. Yeah, yeah, it's good. Um, so you're here at South by Southwest. What are you guys doing? So we're a big virtual team. We have a full-time developer who lives in New Zealand. And we said, let's do a code jam, get everybody in the same place to work around South by Southwest. So you asked them when they came in. We came in Wednesday. So we've been Wednesday. here a long time and kind of working every night. And, uh, Beautiful. Yeah, uh, move yeah. your mic up a little bit. Beautiful. Yep. And how is CrowdFusion going? You open sourced it at TechCrunch 50. And uh, it's the, described it as like WordPress and all these other pieces of software put together. Do you have uh, yeah. clients yet? Uh, we do. Actually, so we have uh, something we're launching at the end of the month. And we can't talk about it yet, but we can talk about it like in April. Great. And how is the business environment out there? You've been meeting with clients. Are people spending money yet? Is the economy in free fall? What, what's? Yeah, so it's not, it's not in free fall. Um, we're spending more money every week. And it's getting more money every month. Yeah. OK. Uh, and. Thanks for coming by. And let's say hello to uh, Don Dodge is here. Can we get Don Dodge up for a minute? Oh, wait. Thanks, Brian, for coming by. Don Dodge is here. Put Don on. Everybody knows Don spent, I'm moving it to five here. Don spent, uh, I don't know, about five or six years at Microsoft. Five, yeah. Five years at Microsoft. And uh, then during the first layoffs Microsoft ever had, you were the first guy to go. <laughs> Congratulations. Uh, who knew? And so you get laid off from Microsoft. You've been there for five years. You are like the heart and soul of Microsoft in the valley. And uh, then you wind up at Google three weeks later. Uh, ten days later. Ten days later. Uh, so that's how it happens in the industry. Musical chairs. Uh, tell us, how has it been at Google for the first couple of uh, months? I've been there three months now, and it's, it's great. Google is a very different company than Microsoft. Yes. Um, Google's only 10 years old. Right. And for startups, I've worked with startups all my life, 10 years old is like an old company. But right. in the scheme of things, uh, Microsoft is 35 years old. Right. Uh, so it's, it's a young company, growing fast. Uh, it's great. Love it. Um, and thoughts on China? I know you speak for all of Google. Uh, I'm, since you work there, so let me go right to the hardest uh, issue here. Uh, what are Larry and Sergey uh, asking you in terms of your opinion for China and what Google should do? Amazingly, they haven't asked me about that. <laughs> I don't know why. Well, what do you think about it? I mean, you're you're a senior executive there. What do you think about China and if you have to be there or not? Does Google have to be there, or is it better to take a stand and sort of not be censoring the results and dealing with the sort of cyber attacks? What's the company's line on this? Uh, I like my job at Google, yeah. and I'm not going to say anything about it. Oh, you can't that. say anything about it. <laughs> very good diplomat. Uh, Sorry. <laughs> well, I can tell you something about it. I think it's very brave, number one. Uh, and I think somebody's got to sort of stand up to it a little bit, because if not, um, they're going to think they can have all the good things about the internet, right? And they can sort of grow their society, whatever. But then 
that they get to do all these bad things from the sort of pre pre internet days like censorship. So it sounds like a pretty bold thing. How, what's the, what's the vibe inside the company about it? Since well, you can't I, talk I, about I it? can just tell you my personal yeah, experience. Yeah, how do you feel personal? I happened to be in China in December for a conference, totally unrelated to my work at Google. Uh, so just as a tourist and doing personal things, it was an angel conference actually, World yeah. Business Angels Conference, and. I was kind of oblivious to what was going on in China. I, I really had no idea until I got there. And uh, I, on my laptop, I tunneled into Google uh, and to do all my work and yeah. web surfing, and everything was great. And uh, went off and did some sightseeing, came back, turned my laptop on, and I started doing some searching. And I couldn't get to Facebook, and I couldn't get to Twitter. Yeah. And I, I was like, what the hell's going on here? So I thought, something's wrong. And then it dawned on me, oh, this is the experience that Chinese people get right. when they're not tunneling in. They can't get to Facebook. You know what works extremely well over there, I'm told, uh, is when you BitTorrent American shows when you're in China and you miss your episode, there's like 10,000 people downloading the last episode of Lost. And you can download it in about 10 seconds. So they'll block everything, <laughs> but they'll allow all the American shows to be BitTorrented. And it's literally 10 or 20,000 people, high speed, yeah. seeding stuff. Uh, VPN is a wonderful thing, yeah. and they're going to discover VPNs. So thank you for all your support over the years. Thanks for being on the program. Oh, and, thank you. Uh, Looking forward to TechCrunch. Uh, yeah, me too. I yeah, wonder if it's going to happen. Um, <laughs> I'll let you know. Uh, and good luck at Google. Well, thank you. Thanks for all the Thanks support. Thanks for inviting me on. Good, good to see you. you. All right. I see the, dr the, the drunk bus is pulled outside. Um, Matt Coffin, come on up, up here for a second. Have a seat. Matt Coffin was on the program maybe in the, what, the first 20 episodes or so, 10 episodes. Uh, Matt Coffin's one of my old uh, friends. Uh, not that he's old, he's a pretty young looking guy, but I hope uh, not. great entrepreneur. A lot of people saw him on the program, sold Lower My Bills for about a half a billion dollars to Experian, mm -hmm. and is now angel investing. Has angel invested in 20 companies or so? 15? About 15. Yeah, about 15 companies. And how is that going in 2010? Are you seeing more deals, less deals? Um, I'm, I'm seeing uh, a lot more deals. I think there's a enormous amount of creativity. The South by Southwest sort of personifies what's going on. There's a lot of creativity, a lot of companies that are, that are going at it. And I think I'm seeing a lot of companies that are focused around um, profitability and revenue much earlier in sort of their life cycle. And any investments so far in the last three or four months that we would know that you can uh, mention? Um, I invested in a com one company called Caring.com. This is a weird microphone. Yeah. And um, another company that is based in Utah that is um, in the sock business, totally um, off the <laughs> off the focus. Um, um, from the founder of uh, one of. The CEO of LogoWorks started a new sort of action adventure company. And then um, there's another, a number of stuff that I'm um, looking at uh, right now, sort of as we speak. And, and I'm specifically super, super interested in local e commerce. Not local advertising, but local e commerce. That's a specific area that I'm so like, super excited uh, about. So, Groupon or Postabon or all these things? Yeah, I think Groupon and Postabon are a segment yeah. of that market. I think there's a lot of other innovation that you're going to see, and I'm looking to both start those companies and invest in those companies. And if somebody approaches you as an angel, uh, what do you like to see? I mean, do you look at people who have just a business plan, or do you want to see a finished product? Do you want to see a finished product with traction in the marketplace? Yeah, um, all three. I'm, I'm interested in all three. I would come in at almost any stage. In terms of ground floor startup, I'm really looking for a business um, or sales and marketing oriented person combined with um, an engineer. I think without that and you're just business and marketing, it's just a tough slog and it's tough to get a great engineer on your team. Time goes by, the cycles are going, and suddenly there's five competitors and you're done. So you have to have technical people on the founding team for you to be interested. Or, or you're a previous um, entrepreneur, like when you started Mahalo, I don't right. think, or, or yeah. right, there were no employees, but you'd already built a company successfully, so you knew to hire that guy, that guy, that guy, and that guy. 
and you could attract talent, so it's a dramatically less risk. Awesome. Thanks for being on the program. Glad to be here. I see Tony Shea is here somewhere. Thank you, Matt. That's very nice. Do we have Tony Shea? I saw him walk in. Oh, there's Tony. Hey, Tony. Thanks for coming by. Uh, and uh, I know an old friend of mine is here. Is, is Shell Israel in the building? Shell around? Of course. Let's get that microphone over to Shell while we get get Tony up here, and then give that microphone to Shell Israel. I got to talk to Shell Israel for a second. Oh boy, you knew it was coming. Oh wow, look at this, books and things. Wow, delivering happiness, a path to profits, passion, and purpose. Okay, Shell Israel is here. Shell, how are you doing? What? What do you want? What do you want, McCabe? You have a whole show here. Always breaking my hump about something. I just, uh, I was hoping I could get some advice on social media marketing. Yes. What's, what's, yes. what's the... I think you need to plug more. You don't plug Mahalo enough. Never, I never plug Mahalo on the show. That's rule number one. Rule number one. Uh, tell me, Shel, uh, your consulting business, your books. Yes. Going, going fabulously, I yes. hear that you've now broken a thousand orders for the two books combined. Yes, a thousand. We shipped a thousand on both books. Me and Scoble are really proud, so I'm going to pick him up out of the gutter somewhere later, and we'll probably have a drink. And uh, Robert Scoble is, uh, of course, here at South by Southwest. How yes. Is the, how is the most embarrassing picture of Robert Scoble contest going? It's going well. We had a lot of submissions last night. He's off to a strong start, as always. Awesome. And uh, uh, Lauren Feldman, did he ever sell you back your domain name? Actually, Dan Farber tricked him into giving it back to me. Farber hired Feldman for one day to work at CNET. He gave him the name back to me, and then he fired him. Wow. Uh, and uh, any advice, finally, Shell Israel, on working the South by Southwest event on a social basis? Yes, I have advice. Have a big pocket of money, buy drinks for everybody, and try not to vomit on someone. All right, thank you, Shell Israel, uh, for stopping by. That's amazing, Shell Israel. Awesome <laughs> program. Uh, what's that? Water? Yeah, can we get uh, eight ounces of vodka for Tony Shea? Uh, can we get some water? Some water to the stage, please. Anyone, just pass it forward. Uh, and thank you uh, to Looped. The Looped folks paid for all of our drinks. And thank you to Euphonics and Redpoint uh, for helping out with the food. Great sponsors helping out. Great job, guys. Uh, Tony, how are you doing? Good. Yeah? How are you? Uh, what was the last thing you remember from last night? Last night, I remember the bus got back to the hotel. We, we shut down the bar. And then we were in your room in the Hilton. And then there were about 25 people in the room. And then four security guards came. I, that's the last thing I remember. Is yeah. that accurate? Uh, I don't remember the security guards, but I did wake up and there was food all over the floor. Right. That was... It was a rough night. So now you are here at South by Southwest promoting your amazing new book, Delivering Happiness, uh, A Path to Profits, Passion, and Purpose. Uh, how is the book going? Why did you write the, decide to write the book? Um, so I finished writing the book actually last year, and uh, and it's the official release date is June seventh. And originally, it was just one of those things where it was something I just wanted to check off, you know, the list like running a marathon. Right. And um, but it, so the book basically is divided into a few different sections. It starts with kind of my early business ex experiences and mistakes, taught everything from the lemonade stand to uh, the pizza business. The Link Exchange, uh, which we ended up selling to Microsoft back in '98, and then right. and then Zappos, and then and then it talks a lot about our philosophies at Zappos, and a lot of those come from the mistakes that had been made in, in previous businesses, and and then there's a whole section about the science of happiness and using research that's been done on the science of happiness and applying that to uh, making employees happy, making customers happy, and making vendors happy as well. Absolutely, and I went to tour your office at Zappos, and it is a 
I mean, the only way to describe it is a cult. I mean, these people are obsessed with being at that company. They're truly happy. You walk around the place, and every section has a cheer. Mm -hmm. Everybody's totally stoked to be there. And when you call up customer service, you're talking to a customer service rep, which usually is the most miserable person in the world, right? I mean, if you have to deal with all day long people's problems, they're actually happy. And they're thrilled with the, you know, dealing with the customers and thrilled to work with the company. How do you get people, even in those positions and those jobs, which are, let's face it, those jobs are hard to do day in and day out. That's like blocking and tackling and dealing with pissed off customers. How do you keep those people motivated? Um, it's interesting because you know, there's a lot of um, uh, consultants and books that talk about how to motivate uh, employees and, and there's a lot of different ways that different companies do that. They, you know, some in, try to motivate employees through incentives, some try to motivate employees through recognition, a lot of uh, companies motivate employees through fear. But what we found is that there's a huge difference between inspiration and motivation and if you can inspire your employees through a combination of having a vision and greater purpose that's beyond just money or profits or being number one in market and if you can inspire your employees by having a company's values, core values, actually match their personal values, then you can accomplish so much more and not actually worry about the motivation part of it. Um, you know, there's that story of um, three, a guy passes by and sees three different uh, people, bricklayers laying bricks, and the first one is you know, not happy at all, laying bricks really s slowly. The second one is happier and being more productive, and the third one is like, really happy and being super productive laying bricks and even though, and they're all doing the same task so he's asking so the guy asks them you know, what are what are you doing and he goes to the first guy and the first guy says I'm laying bricks and and then he goes to the second guy asks him what he's doing and says well I'm building a wall and then he goes to the third guy asks him what he's doing and he says I'm actually building a cathedral and so it's the exact same task but there's different meaning behind it Test. So I think for our employees, it's not just about, oh, you know, you're, if you provide great service, then it's going to make more money for Zappos. It's, it's really, there's a greater purpose, and it's really about, you know, we've framed it as delivering happiness, so hence the title of the book, and it goes beyond just making our customers happy, but also sharing a lot of what we've learned over the years and the mistakes we've made with other companies. and. Um, and really, you know, we want it to ripple out beyond just, just Zappos. Right. Um, so let's take, we have a bunch of segments during the show. One of them is Ask Jason, supposed to be Ask Jason and Tony, where people ask questions. Uh, so do we have the uh, microphone for Ask Jason? Where does that occur from? I'm not sure. Uh, let's get that set up. Well, yeah. Rob, are you uh, available? Here he comes. Here we go. I hear the phone ringing. Come on so down to the stage, There must be somebody with a question who needs help. Hustle, hustle, somebody, hustle. Somebody needs help somewhere. Let this guy through. And now you have, up, a, you have a bus here, and you, you're, you're driving the party bus around town to deliver mm -hmm. happiness. I was on it last night. Yep. Stripper pole and a lot of vodka, and certainly a lot of happiness going on inside that bus. Uh, why the bus, and how is that going? Is this like a good marketing yeah. uh, uh, cool. Yeah, so originally the idea was just uh, every time, every year I come to South by Southwest, uh, run into a bunch of friends, and, uh, and usually people are split up at different bars and whatever, and it's hard getting people to meet, and even if people show up at the same place, sometimes it's really crowded, so we, so the idea came up, let's just have a bus, it's actually a converted school bus, 40 feet long, and we have a bartender on board, yeah. and basically it's an easy way for my friends to get together and, and, and meet. And then so then we decide to wrap the bus to promote the book. Yeah. And so, yeah, the bus has just been driving And around. everybody in the audience, I understand, is now getting a VIP pass for the bus for the rest of the week, correct? Uh, We're going to need a bigger bus. There's not much room on the bus. But, <laughs> yeah. but, 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 there's not enough room for everyone, but maybe you can do that as part of your giveaway. We can give away one give or away, two passes. Give away two passes for the bus? Yeah. Really? So, so maybe what we'll do is we'll put those in one or two of the books, and then when we give out the books, people will uh, have a little golden ticket right. in it. Okay, and so behind us uh, is um, a big strapping young fellow, and he has a question. Tell us your name, tell us what city you're from, and tell us your question. So my name is Rob May. I'm from Louisville, Kentucky. I'm the CEO. My question is, when you're at an early stage startup, how much do you focus on 
what your competitors are doing versus just sort of heads down, do your thing, and, and don't worry about it? Great. So this is an awesome question for those people who didn't hear it. Uh, Rob from Backupify, which is an awesome company, uh, asked, when you're at a startup company, how much time should you spend working on your business plan and your, your product line, I guess, and how much time should you spend obsessing about your competitors? Yeah. What do you think? You go first. I'm more interested in your answer. Oh, uh, I, I would say don't worry about uh, competitors at all. Um, and, and, and it's really just, if you just focus on the user experience and you know, the customers, then, and it's something that you're actually really passionate about, then, you, yeah, you, you're, I think you'll naturally stay ahead of competitors if you have a team that's actually passionate about whatever it is you're building. So more focus on team building than worrying about the short term, battling it out, you know, uh, feature by feature, service by service? Uh, yeah, I guess I wouldn't even think of it in terms of features. It, I would really just think about, like, what would, I mean, for me, it would be, like, what would I actually use on, on a day-to-day -day basis? And right. then just keep improving uh, upon that. So, and, and just as an example, for using Zappos as an example, you know, if we just focus on, you know, we, we there are a few other online shoe retailers when we started. Right. And if we just focus on what they were doing, we probably wouldn't have done the, ended up doing things like free shipping both ways, or 365 day return policy, or um, you know, doing surprise upgrades to o overnight shipping, or focusing a lot on customer service. Like, so when when you were building that, did you you didn't look at Amazon and say, here's the feature matrix of everything Amazon, our biggest competitor, is doing, and say we have to have that? Or no, you did that and just didn't make it a major focus? No, it was really just based on what customers we're telling us, so the feedback from customers. And so obviously, if customers are using competitors' uh, products or uh, services, then you know, there'll be some element of what the competition is doing coming back from customers. But I would really just focus on the customer feedback. So focus on the customer, don't worry about the short term. Um, there is a little bit, though, of a perception issue in the industry. So you're, you were a seasoned entrepreneur and were funding Zappos yourself. If you're an up-and-comer and you're Gowalla versus Foursquare, and Looped and you know all these other you know location-based services. Certainly, you have to worry a little bit about your competitors closing deals and getting press, right? Um, I don't know how much. I mean, ultimately, it just comes down to if, can you make you know for for apps, can you make, make something that's super addictive that you yourself would right. want to and your friends or and your mom would want to use uh, yeah. over and over again. And so, just make an addicting product and deal with it later. No, don't worry about your competitors. Uh, that's my personal point of view. I like that one. I also like making client competitors feel really depressed when you just steal their employees and do stuff like that. Do you ever do that? Try to like steal employees and stuff like that? Uh, no, but we're located in Las Vegas, thank you. Uh, and so it's it's hard to steal the Las Vegas employees. Uh, you, so basically, Las Vegas is a recruiting tool. You're saying. Well, once you're in Las Vegas, there aren't a bunch of other startups that we're competing with. Right. It, it, and why would you leave Las Vegas? Uh, yes, right. And, and so when people come, then they generally Yeah, that's say. interesting. Okay, and so we have two uh, Shark Tank people. Don has a oh, Don has a question. Okay, so here's a, uh, a, fine, a fine young strapping fellow from Google who has a question. Hi, Tony. Uh, I have a two part question for you. I'm very curious about how you did it. So the two parts of the question are if you took Tony Shi out of Zappos, would Zappos still be as successful? And the second part of it is, if you put Tony Shi in Detroit at GM, could you make GM as successful? Okay, so the question, Tony Shea, is how critical is the CEO to uh, the startup, and would you like to go work with a dying company and make them better, and would you be able to turn around a GM? Um, I think in the, in the beginning, uh, you know, when, when companies are smaller, then each individual employee is a lot more uh, in, important. But definitely, our, our goal at Zappos is to make it so that it, it, it's not just me, but we're not relying on any one employee. And we actually right. have this whole, uh, we, have, we have a team called the Pipeline Team, which is basically our employee training team. And our vision is actually five years from now, the vast, vast majority of our employees are hire, hired at entry level. And we provide them with all their training and mentorships so over a five to seven year period. They can become a senior leader within the company. 
And you know, a lot of uh, companies like to say people are the most important asset. And the problem with that is as soon as a person leaves, then you've lost an asset. Right. Whereas our, our vision for our pipeline, we want the pipeline to be our asset so that you know, we'll have employees at all different stages of, um, of their growth and, and progression. And so if someone does leave, you have someone right behind them and, and right ahead of them. That can kind your of job as CEO is to slot. make yourself in some ways uh, you know, not critical. Yeah, and make yeah, the well, system absolutely self-sustaining without you. Yeah, uh, and not just me, but ideally, you know, for, Anybody. for everyone. Anybody. Right? Uh, how long does that typically take at a startup to, to sort of make yourself uh, not critical in the process? Uh, I, I would say it's, um, I don't know, a long time. A long time, think, years. Um, yeah. And would you ever uh, want to, and could you ever, do you think if you put your mind to it, would you be able to turn around a car company? Uh, I have no idea what goes on at a car company. I, th I think it's really easy. Well, did you know what goes on in a shoe company before you started Zappos? I mean. No, so, you know, and, and actually the challenges that we've faced over the years are, you know, not at all what one would think. And, and so I think it's easy for us to judge from the outside, uh, oh, you know, we could do a better job, but I have no idea what goes on inside of a car company. Right. So would you ever think about doing that? You wouldn't even do that. That's too uh, crazy. I, not, yeah, I, I think it's pretty hard to turn around cultures, especially bad cultures. Yeah. Um, You'd rather just start from the bottom up. Yeah. Well, Much easier. I mean, yeah, we'd rather just have Zappos build cars. Yeah. Can you guys hear Tony okay up there? It's a little low. Uh, uh, can you pull your uh, microphone up just a wee bit? And there we go. How are we doing with the audio over here, okay? Yeah. The house audio? The house audio? Yes. Ah, okay, so let's close the door. That's one thing. A little on the fly tech. Uh, and Mark Scarpa, uh, audio expert, what, what else should we do? Check the line. Okay. Okay. Uh, yeah, speak up. <laughs> Thank you, Shal Ezreal. Uh, all right, so now, uh, the guy with the puppet nose. Uh, so now we do a part on the program called the Shark Tank. So let's start this up. Three of these guys, are, or two of these guys, or three of these guys, three people are going to pitch you for under a minute, uh, hopefully 30 seconds or 45, but up to a minute. We're going to give them feedback on their pitches. Uh, and if we would invest in those companies or how interested we are in them and try to help them along in their way. And then we're actually going to see who wins. And uh, let's start that. All right, here we go. Uh, so. Oh, and by the way, uh, thank you to Bing for uh, sponsoring uh, the Ask Jason segment. And Bing tomorrow is having a panel at 9.30 a.m., augmenting maps with reality, uh, exploring the rise of, yeah, okay. Uh, and uh, people like Flickr, Twitter, and Foursquare, and Navtech are on that. And you can go check that out at 9.30 a.m., augmenting maps with reality, 9.30 a.m. Okay, so we have our first... Uh, contestant here. Three, two, one, go. Hi, I'm Josh with Script.com. Script.com is a screenwriting community of 50,000 screenwriters. We make our money by helping content producers find the uh, content to produce. Our clients include acclaimed independent producer Edward Burns and nine-figure screenwriter Stephen D'Souza of Die Hard fame. Finding quality content that doesn't break the bank is a hard nut to crack, but at Script.com, we think we've cracked it. Uh, our business model is about bringing efficiency to Hollywood, and we do this by creating a marketplace for both screenwriters and buyers to, to sell their scripts. And we provide value with the uh, script filtering techniques, both technological and human. In, essence, in a nutshell, think of us as the eBay for all your scripted content. Okay. Thank you. Great. Well done. Uh, so, Tony, uh, what is his business? 
were you able to get what the business is from his description? It sounded like a marketplace for scripts for Hollywood. That's what it sounded exactly. like to me. A marketplace for scripts for Hollywood. Do you think that this is a good idea? Uh, I don't really know how Hollywood works. Uh, my sense is that a lot of it is uh, relationships, and yeah, and so, so I don't know. It's kind of like, for example, you, you invest in a lot of startups, and I don't know if you would use the marketplace, for right? That. Like, you, like you, for you, I'm guessing it's very referral based. It's right. It is very referral based, and so I don't know. May, that's my assumption right. about Hollywood, but so, I uh, that's my that that's my feeling too. Like, uh, isn't this like something that is largely based on relationships and? How do you get people who their value in the system is the relationships to want to participate in something where their value is evaporated and disintermediated? Right. Okay, but so my take on this is right now, Hollywood is all about who you know, right? Where we want to change Hollywood is we want it to be about how good you are. And that's script in a nutshell. Okay. Bringing the best content to the surface. Okay, so the quality will uh, make that happen. Let's get our next contestant up. Well done. I'm going to have you guys vote based upon applause at the end. So, is there a drink coming Tony's way? Oh, and I got some water too. Beautiful. Okay. Uh, so, uh, are you ready? Good to go, Jason. I, I like the uh, vest. Thank uh, you so much. And uh, thank you for uh, bringing the bagels. The bagels were amazing, <laughs> and uh, well done on uh, uh, obeying the twist uh, startup uh, rule of having a tie on <laughs> Shark Tank. Uh, you have one minute, three, two, one, go. My startup's called Euphonics, and we've been described uh, by Tyler, actually, as the Google Docs for rock stars. What we're trying to do is do, uh, make it really, really easy for musicians to collaborate online so they can write together and play together from wherever with whoever. The two real uses for this and the two real users for this are independent bands, amateur musicians, where let's say somebody's in Montreal, plays drums for a high school punk rock band, but then decides to go to school in Toronto, in Texas, in wherever they go, their band has to break up currently because there's no way for them to keep jamming online together. That's one of the things we're trying to solve. The second issue is to make it really easy for established musicians to market themselves and to create a community around their music, getting their fans to work with them to create uh, in the creation process to write their songs with them. Um, the business model of this, which I think you're looking at, I don't want to get too big into it, but I really can't. Okay, so uh, good job. Yeah. Tony, uh, I think we heard that it's a collaboration tool for bands to jam together. It's pretty interesting. I think it ultimately comes down to how, you, how good the can't product actually yeah. is. Is his microphone on? Okay. Let's see. Okay. Um, Tony's very soft spoken uh, and hungry. Uh, so, uh, any question for him? What's your question? Business uh, model. Tell us the business model. I don't want to get too big into it because Matt Siegel from Indaba, who I think is my biggest competitor, is actually at this conference and may be watching. Okay. But uh, it basically, uh, there's two. It's a two-headed approach. One is subscriptions, the other is direct sales, but I can't get into the okay. uh, direct sales side. All right, well done. <laughs> All right, and here's our late entry. We have a late entry. Wait, there's a new segment called the old guest drink who gets a drink. I like it, oh, okay, there you go. Thank Very you. nice. Thank you. Uh, I have a feeling that's alcohol. No, it's just ice water? I don't know. Okay, so now this is a late entry into the contest. Brings two drinks. Oh. There you go. I don't know why. I guess they know Tony. I, know, I guess right. that's for me. What is this? Uh, it smells like vodka or something. Vodka soda. Oh, hey. Hello. Uh, I, hey oof. Oofah. Okay. Uh, I see you brought your pillows with you to comfort you. <laughs> yes. Um, and when do you have to be back at the institution? Um, okay. Three, two, one, go. Hi, my name is Roberto from Throwboy Pillows. So we do pillows that cater to a geek audience, and we do pillows that look like uh, chat bubbles that say like WTF, LOL. We also do pillows that look like the Mac icons. And we also have a second business that we do custom pillows for tech companies, and basically any company, but for the most part, tech companies. 
Um, we've done some for Bing. We've done some for Twitter. Uh, I just gave some to you, one with Mahalo, and uh, we also have Zappos. Um, just different things. Another kind of a way to give out some swag when you have a conference or something like that. And rather than giving out, you know, like a USB keychain or something like that or a shirt, I mean, everybody has those, they throw them away. These live with you, you know, they're, they're like a living advertisement. Um, and uh, that's pretty much it. We also have a really, really loyal fan base okay. of people. So uh, thank you very much. Good job. Okay, Tony. I think they want you to throw those into the audience. That would be a good idea. I would love to, but I have to give these to their respective companies. <laughs> okay. Uh, Tony, what do you think of the business, the startup business known as pillows? Uh, well, one, I, I, I want a pillow. You have a pillow now? Here's your Zappos pillow. Oh, thank you. Um, I, but I didn't hear price point, so I don't, are these? Right. On our, our website, they're all $29. They're all made in Seattle. Um, but we're working on getting them done overseas so we can drop price down because we've noticed when we drop price down for, um, <laughs> when we drop price down, the, the thing, you know, the sales go up. But okay. we're, we're working on that. We're not 100% sure if we want to do overseas completely or not. Cause okay, so they're $30, <laughs> if, $30 if you're a patriot and if you hate America and you're a terrorist. <laughs> How much are they? They'd be like $6, basically? Okay. They're less. Uh, okay, well done, well done. Uh, all right, so uh, Tyler, you have our three contestants, line the three of them up. And then Tyler, I'm gonna ask you to put your hand above their heads. Thank you. Uh, now, this is it. I have to say though, in the pitch, if you have the opportunity to make the crowd go crazy, that is a very important thing to do. And he could have made the crowd go crazy just by tossing the pillow into the audience, right? I mean, what would people do for a Zappos pillow? Like, people love Zappos. How many people here buy shit from Zappos? Everybody. That's, everybody loves Zappos. I bought jeans on Zappos. You really want this pillow, though. No, no, you go. Can I throw yeah. it? Show it. All right. Uh, I feel like I, it's like a wedding. I just, whoever gets this is going to get married. All right, very nice. OK. All right. Here we go. All right. Uh, VIP pass, right, exactly. Who wants the Sonos catch? <laughs> I think we're actually giving away a bunch of Sonos. Um, OK, we're, I think we're ready here. Yeah, we're uh, ready, and we actually have something to give away to the winner of this contest. I couldn't contest. hear you. Oh, there's something, I have to read, a, I have to read another ad. Yes. OK, so uh, let me read this ad here, right? Thank you for reminding me. Oh, wait a second. Bing pillows everywhere. Okay. Oh. All right. Behave yourselves. Uh, two. Uh, bing, bing, bing. Is Shell Israel gonna? Well, Shell Israel wants to pitch. No, but Scotty Vest wanted to give you these hats. Is this the Scotty Vest yes, guy? Yes. No, no more with the Scotty. All right, hold on a second. The Scotty Vest guy is constantly. Jason, to once ads. again, I'm your messenger boy. Scott Scotty Jordan from Scotty Vest, couldn't take it, sent us some stuff, there you go. Okay, uh, no more free ads during the show, please. Okay, uh, what, oh, I have to pick the, okay, yeah, wait, wait, but the winner, the winner of this is gonna get something. Do they both get it or one? No, the winner of this, based on the live audience applause. Based on live audience. Is going to get from Power VPS. I got it, I got it, okay. Go ahead and read off. Well, you gotta hear this, guys, okay. So the winner of this is gonna get one year of uh, server hosting from Power VPS, that's a big deal. That's gonna cost a lot of money. They're gonna get one free year of email hosting at DNA Mail, one free year of high-speed internet from DSL Extreme, and an hour of business strategy consulting from Icano, and I will also give you guys an hour at the Mahalo office. You can come by for lunch and hang out with Tyler. Not me, but Tyler. Um, no, I'll be there too, I'll be there too. Um, probably won't. Okay, so uh, first up, uh, the name of the company is Script. How do you spell this? Is it? So two P's. Yep. Okay, so scribby bibbed. Uh, <laughs> put your hand over his head, Tyler. Who wants uh, scribby bibbed to win? Okay. All right. Okay. Not bad. Next. Uh, who would like, what's the name of the company? Euphonics. Okay, Euphonics. Who wants Euphonics? Oh, 
Phonics is looking pretty good right now. All right. And uh, what was the name of the third company, the pillow Throw company? Boy. Yeah. Throw Boy. Who wants a yeah. pillow company? Yeah. All right, all right, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. I couldn't. All right, script, you did good, but script didn't win. Uh, we have a runoff between the other two, I think. Right? Is it, was it a runoff or no? It was definitely pillows. Tyler, I need your expert opinion. Let's do it one more time for between the two. All right, let's two just confirm here. it. We gotta yeah. confirm it. Okay, one more time. There's a lot at stake here. How many people want uh, phonics? We've got phonics. Yes. And how many people want the pillow company? Pillow. All right, that's pretty good. All right, the winner is pillows. Pillow boy. Okay, won congratulations it. to the pillow company. You want? Now give away those pillows. Insane. He'll sure use that uh, free server time. What's that, Tyler? He'll make good use of all that free server time. I, I can't hear anything you're saying. <laughs> all right. So, uh, Tony, let's go back. Shh. How, uh, your first company, Link Exchange. Bought by Microsoft by for a quarter billion dollars or something to this effect. Uh, what was the basic premise of that business, and uh, how did you wind up selling it to Microsoft? Uh, so it was a uh, we were we were the first banner exchange company, and basically back then, not a lot of websites had banner ads that showed up on their on their sites. So uh, basically. We would give you some HTML code to put into your website, and for every two visitors that came to your site, you would earn one credit. And so, for example, if you had a thousand visitors a day, you would earn 500 credits a day. What happens to the other 500? And then, well, so the 500 credits you earn, you would be advertised 500 times elsewhere on the network, and then the extra 500 we would sell to companies like Toyota, for example. And so we could basically give Toyota instant access to this entire network of websites. And so then you wind up selling it to Microsoft. Yep. And, and when, what time frame is this? Uh, this was two and a half years later. But the reason we ended up selling the company was because the company culture just went completely downhill. And um, you know, it, it was a lot of fun when it's just five or ten, ten of us. But by the time we get to 100 people, it just I myself dreaded getting out of bed in the morning. And so. So you hated the working there. Yeah. And, and Why did you hate working there? It's your own company. What happened? Uh, How I did know, it fall apart? Well, that, that was the weird, weird thing. And it basically was because we didn't pay attention to company culture. We hired people that had the right skill sets and experiences, but uh, not all of them were culture fits. And just slowly, you know, the culture just, just went downhill. And, and you know, that, ha it's, that happens all the time. That's, I think that's why most large companies don't have great culture. So with Zappos, wanted to make sure we didn't make that same mistake. So again. when you start Zappos, you were thinking about culture from the, from the get-go? Uh, well, I joined about two months after it started, originally just as an advisor and, and investor. And um, it, I think part of it was just coincidentally had a fun group of people at, at the beginning. And we always thought culture was important, but it wasn't until actually four or five years into it that we made decided culture was going to be the number one priority. And so how, how does a startup make culture the number one priority? Do you write a culture document? Do you have a discussion? What is culture? I mean, it sounds kind of like, to be honest, it's a little frou-frou. Like, we're going to have culture, you know? Like, every time I hear that, I think, that kind of sounds like nonsense to me. Like, shouldn't you be working? Uh, convince me why it's not nonsense. Um, well, if you, if you want a uh, research-based argument, there's been, uh, you know, Tons of studies where they show correlation between uh, employee engagement and employee productivity. And one of the best predictors of employee engagement is whether you have a best friend at work or the number of friends that you have at work. And so that ah. ends up translating back into culture. You know, if, if you're working with friends, then you're you can be a lot more productive than if you're just working with coworkers. So if you can develop more friends inside the company, internal friendships. People will enjoy their job more and want to come to work every day. Yeah, and enjoy each other more and, and the company more. So when we do new um, new uh, manager or orientation, for example, we actually encourage managers to spend 10 to 20 percent of their time outside the office, hanging out with their team or whoever they work with. And a lot of times we 
especially for people coming from another company, they feel like they're not really working, it's wasting time. But then when we ask uh, managers that have done it, how much more productive is your team because there's higher levels of trust, communication is better, people are willing to do favors for each other because they're favors as friends, not favors for coworkers. And the answers we get back range anywhere from 20% to 100%. So kind of worst case scenario, you break even. And, and people enjoy their job. Right. Uh, and the best case scenario, you maybe have a team that's two or three times more productive. Yeah, and, and, and so most, in, most of uh, Zappos employees, when they leave the office, leave to go hang out with other Zappos employees. So uh, it's, it's pretty cool, and it, it creates this family atmosphere. Um, you have how many employees now there? Is it over 1,000? Uh, we have 1,500 employees total. Half are in Vegas, where our headquarters are, and half are in Kentucky, where our warehouse is. Uh, and this whole uh, meme that we saw on the blogs, you pay people $2,000 to quit. What exactly is that, and why did you institute it? Um, well, so I, I think over t originally it was just because our training team, so everyone that's hired goes through the four weeks of training where we go over customer service, the importance of company culture, and, um, and so on. And during those four weeks, what we found is that our training team had gotten pretty good at predicting who was not going to work out six months down the line. And so they had just started, and uh, you know we couldn't really fire them because they hadn't done anything wrong, but usually right. it turned out. So originally it was just it was thought of, oh, this is a way where it can be a win-win for both sides. And, and rather than wait six months for them to eventually leave, you know, we'll, we'll offer, originally it was $100, now it's up to $2,000 to quit and leave the company. And How many people take that out of, uh, um, you know, is it 1% or 10% or 5%? When we, when we first started it in 2007, about 3% of people took the offer. In 2008, 1% took the offer. And uh, last year, I don't think anyone took the offer. Wow. So we keep upping the offer because not enough people Trying to get people to leave job. and they won't take yeah. it. Uh, interesting, fascinating. And so the company was sold to Amazon for a billion dollars this past year. How did that wind up happening? And uh, how is it being inside of Amazon? Are you guys, the deal is done, correct? Yeah, it closed in November. So the deal closed. You sell the company for a billion dollars. Um, how did the deal happen? And is it bittersweet as an entrepreneur? You've sold a company that you hated going to work for every day. So that must have been great. You get the monkey off your back. But I know you love this company. What's it like to sell a company you love, and how's it been working with Jeff Bezos? Yeah, so it's very different from the uh, Link Exchange deal where right. it was trying to get out. Uh, for this, it's really been more just the equivalent of switching out our board of directors for a new one. And so our previous board was uh, basically mostly investors from a technology background, uh, whereas right. Amazon is uh, you know, understands really uh, values customer service, understands retail, and so it's actually the equivalent board meetings that we've had have been uh, much more just aligned, I guess, for, from our own, the, in terms of how we think of things internally at, at Zappos. So I um, actually don't see Jeff Bezos that often. It's, you know, we have the equivalent of a board meeting once every few months, and so that's when I'll see him. So uh, for the most part, you know, one of the most important conditions that we had for doing the deal was that they leave us independent and we continue growing the Zappos brand and culture and, uh, and do business our way. And so there's actually been you know, a lot of uh, examples that have come up already where uh, it's something that Amazon wouldn't do, but uh, we would as right. Zappos. And so they let us make our own decisions. And Jeff Bezos, of course, is very uh, known for also building culture, a unique culture, and being an innovator like yourself. Um, there's been talk, uh, buzz, maybe when Jeff retires, like the reason they bought Zappos was as much to have you run all of Amazon. Uh, I haven't heard that, but um, well, I'm making I it up. Probably... If I heard, I'm saying I just made I that up. Uh, see, uh, no, for me. No, no, I have heard for... that though. I mean, would you be, is that something you'd be interested in, or is no? Uh, probably not. I, I mean, I'm I'm really just uh, you know goes back to to just I, I'm not really interested in running GM or Amazon or right. really any really. I've been with Zappos for over ten years now, and uh, that's the brand that I want to continue building. What's your best advice for the entrepreneurs in the room when they're starting companies? What should they focus on? What should they do? If you could do everything over in your career again, 
what are the three or four things you would absolutely do differently and you'd absolutely advise young entrepreneurs or first-time entrepreneurs, old guys who are doing it for the first time? What, what do they need to focus on? Uh, I'd say number one, do figure out what you're so passionate about doing that you'd be happy doing it for 10 years even if you never made any money during those, those 10 years. And, um, and that's what you should be, because I think a lot of entrepreneurs are uh, really focused on, oh, how can I make money and retire in four, in four years or, or right. whatever. So number one, I'd say follow your passion. Uh, number two, I would say, you know, we, um, you know, going back to the culture thing, uh, we rolled out our core values at Zappos five years into it, and I wish that was something that we had done from day one. Do but, a culture document from the first day. Uh, yeah, I, and it, it makes everything so much easier. And, and actually, I myself personally resisted rolling out our core values because it seemed like one of those big corporate things to do. Right. And there's, you know, there's so many um, examples of companies where they have core values or guiding principles, but it's kind of a meaningless plaque on the wall. And so you actually need to come up with core values that you're willing to commit to, and by committing to meaning that you're willing to hire and fire based on them, regardless of, independent of any And that's really what the tool is for, is for hiring yeah. and firing. And for giving, it empowers each employee to make their own decisions as well. What's interesting about it is, we've been friends for, I guess, a year or two now. We met each other through some mutual friends, and I guess we're both Sequoia companies, or you were, I guess, in that case. And when, I, when you sent me your culture document, I looked at it and I was very skeptical. But then I got my team together and we actually did it as a group. What are the words that we think you know, represent the team at Mahalo? And after we did it, there were maybe two or three people on the team who didn't match it. Mm -hmm. What do you do in a situation like that? And is that what happened to you when you did it at Zappos? Did you have people on the management team who were like, oh my god, I hired people. I got people working here who shouldn't be here. Yeah, and and, uh, you know, the, and we had the same thing happen, and I think for us it was probably you know between five and ten percent of the company. I don't know how many employees used. It would have been ten per, uh, yeah, seven eight percent. Yeah. So uh, yeah, and I think that's kind of ine inevitable, where basically those people need to eventually be managed out. Um, managed out. Yeah. Well, basically, either need to. You know, Go Let them know the they painful, don't fit. Yeah. yeah, go through that painful process. But a lot of times, actually, once you have the culture really defined and everyone understands, they may not agree, but at least they understand what it is that, right. that They're not gonna you stick want, around. then the culture kind of has a way of getting them to look for other opportunities on their own. And you released it to the public, the culture document. And, yep. and it's actually it? in the book, too. And it's so, in the book. Yeah. Uh, awesome. Anything else about the book that you wanted to share? Any, any, what's the most amazing anecdote, or should we not spoil it when people read it? Um, I mean, there's some crazy things that happened in the history of Zappos. Have you read the book yet? I haven't read the book okay. yet. I have it. I've skimmed it, but I'm going to read the whole book. Okay. Um, no, it's just, it's just uh, the feedback I've gotten from people that have read it is, uh, uh, it's, it's interesting because different people like different things about the book. So right. there's some people that say they really in, uh, enjoy uh, hearing all the childhood stories of, you know, the lemonade stand or whatever, and they ask me like, "Oh, why didn't you tell me about that?" And I'm like, "I don't, I don't know how that would come up in normal conversations. Like, if you and I are hanging out, I wouldn't say, "Hey, by the way, when I was seven, like, you know, this thing happened to me in my childhood." And right. It, like, it's a little bit of an overshare. It's yeah, it, it might make you. Yeah, he just even starting with the sentence, "Something happened to me when <laughs> I was seven years old. I need yeah. to share with you." Right. It's got me on. A little nervous. Yeah. So, uh, so some. So I've gotten feedback from people that say they really enjoy that part of it, and there's other people that really enjoy reading about um, kind of us just opening up our internal uh, emails and documents, to, you know, to the public basically. Because, right. and then some people are surprised and like, aren't this? Isn't this proprietary and, and so on? And for us, it goes back to, you know, what's our greater purpose or right. mission, and it's about. If it's about making the world a happier place, then you know the more companies that can uh, avoid a lot of the mistakes that we made, or the more companies that can focus more on making employees or customers happy, the you know happier place the world's going to be. Awesome. Let's bring Juan Harris up here and do the news. We do a little news at the end. Okay. You'll comment on the news. You read. What do you read? What are your uh, publications that you read every day? 
Uh, I don't. I'm very bad at news and current events. Don't really. But what about blogs, email newsletters, anything you read out there? You read TechCrunch, you read Mashable, you read uh, Wall Street Journal. What are you into? Uh, I follow people on Twitter, and that's about it. Okay. Uh, favorite Twitter user? Uh, favorite Twitter user? If you have somebody who you just like, oh my god, these tweets are all brilliant, I have to respond. Um, no, I would say about 95% of the tweets I read are not that interesting. But, but then, but I read through all of them to find the 5%. Find the 5% right? that are truly so. unique and interesting. Lon, what's in the news? Well, our, our top story, let's talk a little bit about South by Southwest. Uh, South by Southwest Interactive becoming a larger and more significant part of the annual technology schedule each year. However, a growing meme seems to be that the conference is really just what's been called a spring break for social media, as Jeremy Pepper put it. Yes. An excuse to get your employer to pay for a week of drinking and yes. partying, more than a productive business event. So uh, do you think, first of all, uh, is, this, is this an accurate uh, description? And is this just South by Southwest? Or is this tech conferences more generally? And finally, as a CEO, and this goes for both of you, really, how do you decide when to send your people to a conference? Um, South by Southwest is one big, long party. Uh, however, there are some good Ooh. panels that go on that people don't attend. Uh, <laughs> no, people attend some of the panels. Sure. Uh, but like Tony was saying, you know, it's, uh, if people go hang out together, and you know this because we work together, we hang out a lot, the more people hang out together, the more collegial they are, the more chance there will be that they will work together on future projects or maybe sure. do business deals. So actually, the only reason people go to conferences typically is to network. It's like maybe 20% education, 80% networking. So I think the only difference with South by Southwest is that people admit it's about networking and having fun. And yes, people drink way too much at this conference. Tony, what are your thoughts? Uh, I agree. I, I mean, I, I do think that most of the value of South by Southwest is from meeting and hanging out with people and building relationships. But you know, that's something that we it goes in line with the whole 20% of your time building relationships. So yeah. uh, I, I mean, I am all, I'm all for having more conferences. How do you decide when to let people go to a conference or not? I mean, I'm, I don't like spending money on that too much at a startup company. It feels like it's a little bit of a boondog. Maybe salespeople, but do you send people to a lot of conferences? And uh, we really leave it up to each individual uh, department or, or person or manager to decide. So. Okay, next story. Uh, well, we should talk about Sonos sponsoring. Sonos uh, this is sponsoring. Event. How many? Wait, we're giving away a bunch of these Sonos. How many Sonos are we giving away? Somebody scream it out. Three? Three of these S5s, which are incredible things. And so if anybody goes to uh, Sonos slash S5, SX, SW, you can win another bunch of them. But we're giving three of these away today. How do I give it away to these guys? I don't, do we have a, a system, or do we just have whoever? Okay. Well, whoever, whoever reads the best news story. I, I, don't, I don't know exactly how to give this away. You can. Um... Uh, pick a random date, and then if it's someone's birthday, they have to show you the. Oh, oh I can do that. Like okay, that. Uh, that's an interesting way to do it by birthday. Okay, so I'm thinking of somebody with a birthday in November. Raise your hand if your birthday is in November. Oh yeah, I'm all over this one. Okay, I'm thinking uh, somebody. You have to have your driver's license. Uh, is anybody's birthday on the 15th? Is anybody's birthday on the 16th? 17th? 18th? Oh, you're so close. Yes. Okay, there's one. Uh, very good. This is going to take forever. This is a crazy idea. All right, give him the Sonos, uh, and then we'll figure out another way to give away the other two. This is, that's way too time consuming. All right, well, we'll do, we'll do the news story. Do another news story. About it. I'll do a news story, and then I'll do another one. There you go. Twitter. That's easier. Okay, somebody, uh, somebody tweet, uh, I love Sonos, and then put a hashtag. Uh, twist. Twist. Pick the next two people. Hi. Hey, how you doing? Nice to see you, Barney. No, we're not going to give it to you right now. We're going to give Let's you information. Let's see some ID also. Where's the idea? Let's see some ID. Tyler, you handle this on that side. Okay. Tyler, you're supposed to handle all these things. Okay, <laughs> good. The sound problem, you're supposed to handle this. Well, good. I just Who's responsible? All I have to do is sound check. It's way too much reverb. Yeah, I, I totally agree. Okay, Barney, get out of here. We'll, we'll get it to you. Barney Pell, of course, of PowerSet, bought for $100 million, and now it's Bing. No, I'm just giving you credit for your startup company bought by Bing. Uh, like this guy needs to get a Sonos. Guy sold his company for $100 million. I don't buy what a waste it. of a Sonos. This guy's probably got like 50 of them in his house. Okay, let's hear the next <laughs> right, story. Well, here's and the then story about Sonos. Yes. Index Ventures out of London has provided $25 million in growth equity capital to Sonos. 
VC Michelangelo Mike Volpe will also be joining the company's board. Uh, the money will likely be used to help Sonus expand it in new markets, including China and Japan. Much of the recent success is based on the S5 unit that we have just given away. Yes. Introduced in November 2009, which allows control of the system via an iPhone and starts at $399. It will also be available for the iPad when that launches in April. Okay. So, uh, you know, what do you, what do you think of this? Do you think this is a, a good investment, and what should Sonus do with this money? Um, that's a good question. Do you have Sonos in your house? Yep. Mm -hmm. I have 11 units in my house. Uh, it's an awesome system, and uh, I don't know. Th these units are pretty good because you just you don't need to get additional speakers. Yes. Uh, I would like to see them build a video product that uses the same sort of toolkit. Interesting. So, so you can have DVDs set up or something. Yeah, you put your because your media library's got it, video in it now, and just stream sure. the video as well. Um, you can watch Precious in any room of your home. Yes, I can, I can want to kill myself yeah, watching right. Precious any, any in any room of my house. Right. Okay, uh, let's give these books away because people yeah. want books, I think. I don't know exactly how we're going to give these away. Uh, I could throw them, but somebody might break their nose. What's the, be how, what's the best way to give these away? <laughs> you can buy a book, Matt. Uh, Tyler, how would I give these books away? We have to think about these things. What's the best way to give a book pick, away? Pick a month. Pick a month? Okay. Uh, you know what? I'll just, uh, I'm going to give Tyler five of these. Tyler, go up to the upper deck there and give. Just, just chuck them at people. No, it's too crazy. Them give those four to four random people there. And I'm going to give. All right, here we go. Uh, let's give it to this guy with, the, uh, with his thing on. He gets that one. You get this one. You get this one. And uh, you, for this young lady here, pass this to the young lady. Right there, and uh, pass it to the nerd with the glasses right there. The thing. I'm a nerd too. And who's last? One of the guys up here. Oh, how did they there you go. Guy to give it to? There you yeah. go. Oh, nice. Uh, we'll toss. Okay. Uh, I would check your books because two of those have a VIP pass. If you have the VIP pass, hold it up. Nobody has a VIP pass. There has to be. Maybe Unless I Tyler gave both away. You have a Zappos pillow, not a VIP. You can't get on the bus with that. Sorry. Uh, we're also giving away uh, one copy of the book a day on uh, the website. So if you go to deliveringhappinessbook.com, yes. uh, you can sign up there and uh, with your email address, and we'll uh, pass those out. Sure thing. Beautiful. Yep. OK, uh, final news story. Oh, final news story. Fine, pick a good one. The pressure's on. I had a Facebook guy confront me in the elevator. He was like, you're wrong about Zuckerberg. And I said, wrong about what? <laughs> Being a felon and breaking into journalists' emails? He goes, well, he did that a long time ago. Yeah, forgive and forget. Yeah. Years ago uh, already. Okay. Uh, oh, final, wow. final. Okay, final I'll, I'll, give you, I'll give you a choice as we do when we're running out of time. Twitter, Bright Kite, Hunch, Chat Roulette, or Sticky Bits. Which sounds good to you? Is Sticky Bits a porn site? Sticky Bits is not a porn site, and it's actually a local All right, ties these, in. Let's do Sticky Bits. All right, new startup Sticky Bits sells vinyl barcode stickers that you can place on real world locations and then attach social media content. So you buy 20 stickers for 10 bucks, then you place oh. them wherever you want. Like you could put one on the door of the Six Lounge. And then all your tweets and audio, video you shoot here, anything you do in Six Lounge, you can attach to that barcode. So other oh. people can scan it with their iPhone and then right. see everything that you did in that location. Uh, so do you think this idea is, does it require too much legwork? Because you, you have to have the app, and you have to have the barcode. I don't understand why you wouldn't just use Foursquare or Goala or something. Yeah, I think the idea would be, it's exactly, but like Foursquare or Location-based. Well, right. you could do Foursquare and Goala, but if you could add, imagine if you could like record a video greeting for someone when they go to your favorite bar. That so would when show you up whenever they check in. Yeah. It. Okay. But it's that seems like a feature you could just add to either of those services. I couldn't could. agree more. I, uh, I think that's exactly These are Q, this is based on Q codes, which is like a right, these are what are these called in QR. Japan? QR, QR codes? QR, yeah. yeah, so these are based on QR codes. It's uh yeah, I think you're right. It's gonna work just as easily in Goala or Foursquare. Is hey, is Josh from Goala here? He was gonna come by and give me a, a bunch of t shirts. I, okay. I, did, I saw a guy with a bag of Goala. He was here earlier? Where's the Goala t shirts? You drop them off? Anyone? Bueller? Nobody? No. Okay. Ah, Sorry. No Guala no t-shirt for you. No t uh, give us one more story. And one more we'll story. We'll talk about chat roulette because I can't resist. 17-year-old oh. Russian high school student Andrei Turni Turnovsky, the visionary behind chat roulette, has applied for a visa and apparently wants to move to America in the aftermath of his invention's massive worldwide explosion in popularity. According to Read Right Web, Turnovsky is currently being courted by Russian investors trying to keep him in Moscow, but he dreams of coming to Silicon Valley to continue his career. So do you think... What kind of future does this guy have? 
have? Is Chat Roulette a lucky break, or do you think he's got a couple more companies up his sleeve? And would you invest in, in his next venture? Uh, you'd have to meet the person. I mean, Chat Roulette is not, it's a, it's a, it was well executed, and obviously it's a meme, so it has, I give him a lot of credit for making a great name. Yeah, um, it's very viral too, it's very, it's very personal. There is a, there is a self-fulfilling prophecy thing though that happens, like you build something that great, you get really confident, and then you think of other ideas, so the guy's got heat, so actually maybe the next two or three ideas people will give attention to. So when you say, hey, the person who made Chat Roulette is now making this, People are going to pay attention, just like, hey, Tony did Link Chair, now he's doing Zappos, now he's doing a book. So you, people do pay attention to your future projects if the past ones were interesting. Sure. So for that reason alone, you could consider investing in that. And, um, but Chat Roulette reminds me of See You, See Me from 1996, it's, which was yeah. where perverted guys would masturbate on camera to for whatever reason they do that. It's, a, it's I don't know, exactly it's, like Explain that. it to me. <laughs> well, why I'm on chat roulette pants list all the time? Yeah, exactly. Oh, who can say? You know? are, you on the, are you on the chat roulette? Have you done it? Uh, I did check it out once, um, but it, it seemed interesting. I, I mean, you press F9 concept. and then the new person comes up. We could do chat roulette right now. Can we you put chat roulette that. up now? That would be interesting. <laughs> can you pull up chat roulette? You know I have to pull it up. Roulette? Hold on, I think I have to pull oh, it up go. here. Okay. Um, this is probably a really terrible idea. Okay, uh, so it's about to get <laughs> I'm going to give a Sonos unit to somebody who guesses how many chat roulettes before a penis. One, three. <laughs> three, one, four, okay. I think three uh, is a solid Those are our, those are our three contestants. You said one, you said four, and you said three. Okay, those are our three contestants. You know what I've noticed is I feel like as it explodes in popularity, the, the ratio is down. It used to be like one out of every two would be a penis, and now it's like one out of every four or five. <laughs> Because more people are using it. So you're disappointed now? Okay, you're, so now I we're am. on number two. This is number two. Next. This could be a penis. That's not a penis. It's, it's about to be. Uh, if it's over four, this guy's going to win. So I think he's in basically the Oh, yeah, the it's the closest without going over. I, I, is Sonos ever going to sponsor anything again since I did penis chat roulette as their way to give away their thing? I apologize. This we is not going to work. We could, have done a, we could have done a perfectly professional story, I know. Okay. Uh, let me thank, uh, we'll give the two Sonos away to anybody who tweets. Uh, we did that before, right? I love Sonos and then Pound Twist. So if you did that, uh, could somebody pull that up on their phone right now and then pick two? And uh, just tell us the name, Tyler. While I thank everybody who made this possible, uh, thank you to Bing and Sonos uh, for uh, being our title sponsors today. Give them a big round of applause, everybody. They pay for everything. Uh, thank you to... Um, Loot and Euphonics, uh, and thank you to uh, PowerVPS, Bing, Ustream, DNA Mail, uh, WebSpy, and uh, did I miss anybody? Oh, Redpoint. Redpoint. Redpoint paid for all the food. I uh, included them before. That's a VC firm. That's a very great VC firm who did VRBO, Vacation Rentals by Owner, if you want to rent a house of a rich guy who uh, is broke now. That's how you do it on VRBO. Oh, nice. Uh, and they also are in Postris, which I use every day. Postris is a great site. Postris uh, is fantastic, yeah. Tyler will, Tyler will just reply to those two people with the Sonos units, and they're giving away Sonos units on uh, sonos.com slash south by southwest. Uh, Tony, thank you for being on the program. Yeah. Thanks, uh, It was awesome having you, and we'll see you all next time. I could triple referee, tell by my attitude that I most definitely from.